So we've been working through some emotions now. And uh, last week we talked, just we laid a foundation for emotions. Today I want to talk to you about happiness for the next hour and a half. (laughs) Worth 26 minutes. What is happiness? Better said, what makes you happy? Boy, you guys are quiet. You don't know what makes you happy? Okay. Let's do some definitions. Psychology today, philosophers, theologians, psychologists, and even economists have long sought to define happiness. And since the 1990s, a whole branch of psychology, positive psychology, has been dedicated to pinning it down and propagating it. More than simply positive mood, happiness is a state of well-being that encompasses living a good life, that is, with a sense of meaning and deep satisfaction. Here's another definition. I think this one was Webster. Feeling or showing pleasure or contentment. Another definition of happiness, delighted, pleased, or glad. In your old covenant, or in the Hebrew language, Asher, blessedness and happiness would be a good way that we can translate that. And uh, just because I I wanted to mess all of you up, I kind of threw an audible at them this morning and asked them to read out of the Young's literal translation. So when they were reading the scripture, it was Young's literal. We probably don't even have that in media. They were probably scrambling, trying to go, what translation is that? He always does new living. My fault. Um, In the New Testament, the Greek language is makairos, uh, happy, blessed, fortunate to be envied, supremely blessed, well off, or I like this one, when God extends his benefits to you. And then Wearsby went so far as to say it has to do with divine joy. Most of the translations outside of English translations use the word happy when they translate the scripture instead of the word blessed when you look at the Beatitudes that we read a little bit easier, which is why I kind of read happy is the man, happy. Um, If you're happy and you know it, (laughs) do you know why you're clapping? I said, if you know why you're happy, then you can clap. (laughs) That was pretty good. I was impressed by that response. And then in pop culture today, there's a song called Happier by this guy named Marshmallow and a band named Bastille. And it's really about, I'll be happier if you leave. I'm not sure how that makes me happier, but... (laughs) And then the video is about this little girl who's being bullied, and then her dad gives her a dog, and then the dog dies. I don't know how that makes you happier. I'm not sure if they quite got the, the handle on what makes you happy. Raptors fans are happy today. <laughs> Milwaukee fans, probably not so happy. Aristotle considered happiness an activity that we pursue. Interesting. Bear with me. Definitions. Epicurus, or the Epicureans, they believe that pleasure is the highest goal, which is equal to being at peace with oneself in an absence of physical pain. So if you're at peace and you have no pain and pleasure is the highest goal, you're an Epicurean. I kind of don't really agree with their philosophy, but you know what? There's also the hedonists, or the hedonists, however you want to say it, one who pursues pleasure and self-gratification. Many in our culture fall into that category today. I have some quotes. Our greatest happiness does not depend on the condition of life in which chance has placed us, but is always a result of a good conscience, good health, occupation, and freedom in all just pursuits. That was Thomas Jefferson. He also penned something that my American friends would know. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Very good. Happiness does not depend on any external conditions. It's governed by our mental attitude. Dale Carnegie. I think he's along the right track. Your happiness is not based on what's going on around you. It's not even based on your circumstance. It's based on what's going on inside of you, specifically your thought process. We'll get to that in a second. Research, psychology today again, 
shows that much of happiness is under personal control. In other words, you are responsible for your happiness, period. No one else is. Too many people look to others for their happiness. In 2004, Darren McMahon claimed that over time, the emphasis shifted from the happiness of virtue to the virtue of happiness. Let me ask you this. Does character drive happiness? Sorry, does happiness drive character? I think I wanted to word it that way. Does your character drive your happiness? Or does happiness supersede your character? Because over the years, the culture's eroded to the place today where people ignore moral and ethical values and moral and ethical truth They throw aside white and wrong, right and wrong, so that they can please themselves. Selfishness gone to seed. But in their quest for happiness, they're not happy. Which is why people reach the pinnacle all the time, and then what do they do? They jump because they're hopeless. Without Christ, you'll never be happy. Happiness is a way of life. Primarily, it's derived from living in God's presence and being with the Creator. Spending time with Jesus is a prerequisite for you to be truly happy. If you want true happiness, you have to spend time with Jesus. What does Psalm 16 say in verse 11? You will show me the way of life, granting me the joy of your presence and the pleasures of living with you forever. There's a way of life that you will only find by spending time with the Creator. If you refuse to spend time with the Creator, you're not going to have Him show you the way of life. It only comes through relationship. It only comes through time. It only comes through being with Him so that you can become like Him. We have to choose happiness. Has anyone ever played the if-only game? If only I had a better job. If only I had more money. If only I had this relationship. If only I had those new shoes. Or maybe more accurately in some cases, if only I had that new purse. But that one's not aimed at anyone. Wink, wink. (laughs) If only my I will remain unnamed hockey team could win. Sometime in the next 50 years. <laughs> if only, if only, if only. Have you ever played that game? You think that if you get what you want, your situation would change, your happiness level would change? I'm going to tell you something. Has anyone got a perfect marriage besides Pastor Howie and Marsha? I'm just telling you what he said this morning. None of us have a perfect marriage. But you know what? If you want to have a good marriage with some happiness, you have to work at it. Because left to itself, it's not going to be very happy. If you don't put any energy and effort into your marriage, you're not going to have a very happy marriage. What can you change in your life? My wife's picking on me. (laughs) (laughs) Isaiah 48. If you only paid attention to my commands, your peace would have been like a river and your well-being like the waves of the sea. See, even God does that. Hey, Israel, if you would have only listened to me, you'd have peace and you'd have righteousness, but you didn't. So now you've got a tough time. Do you know they've done research with lottery winners? I think it's somewhere around 60-something percent of people that win over a million dollars are worse off financially after five years than they were before they won. It's not about getting what you want that makes you happy. Unless your desires are aligned with God's desires. So let's move on from that. In Philippians 4, chapter... Uh, verse 4 through 14. I'll see how much I can read of this. I might jump. Always be full of the joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. 
Let everyone see that you're considerate in all you do. Remember, the Lord's coming soon. So, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. So, we're supposed to not what? Pray. And we're supposed to pray? Pray always. Pray about everything. Worry bad, prayer good. Tell God what you need and thank Him for what, he do what He's done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and mind as you live in Christ Jesus. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and love me and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing. Then the God of peace will be with you. He goes on and he says, I have learned the secret of living in every situation, whether with full stomach or empty, with plenty or little. I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. You see, it has to do with our thought life and what we focus on. If you're focusing on negative things, you're not going to be very happy. If you're focusing on things that are excellent and worthy of praise and admirable, that's going to affect your mental thought process. We need to learn to align our thoughts with the mind of Christ. We need to learn to align our thoughts with the Word of God. We need to align our thoughts to truth, not lies. Researchers have found that happiness typically involves times of considerable discomfort. <laughs> Sign me up, Jack. <laughs> involves times of considerable discomfort. But I don't want to go through a time of discomfort. I just want to be happy. Yeah, that's the problem, you hedonist. <laughs> Galatians 5. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But don't use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you'll be destroyed by each other. See, the Bible's telling us about serving each other in this context that we're reading here. Don't use your freedom for the flesh, but serve each other humbly in love. If you want to be truly happy, you're going to have to serve some others. Because this life is far too short to be all about number one or all about you. It needs to be about others. We've talked about this on multiple occasions. Marie Osmond, Marie Osmond, being of service to others is what brings true happiness. You know, I've been talking about we serve. We talked about how we serve here at the church. We want to serve others. Someone came to me, a couple of people actually, and said, well, I'm exhausted. I've been working too hard for way too long and I just need a break. I have no problem with that. Take a break. But as to being exhausted all the time while you're serving Christ, Matthew 11 tells me, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I'm humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. I assure you, the walk of faith that we live in Christ is much easier than having to deal with the burden of the law. You will never earn your salvation through your good works. We were never designed to do that. We don't even, we're not even qualified to do that. It's the grace of God. But see, it's the light burden upon us because we live life from the inside out. So when we spend time with him, he changes our heart. As he changes our heart, it's a joy to serve. It should not exhaust you serving Jesus. If you're serving him and you're exhausted, we have to stop and look at what's driving this inside of us. Are we trying to be something God has not called us to be? Are we trying to do something he hasn't asked us to do? Are we being disobedient to what he's asked us to do because we want to do what we want to do? Probably the more plausible solution there. Oh, come on, we're talking about happiness. Some of you don't look very happy with me. That's okay, it gets better. Persecution, woohoo, produces happiness. <laughs> Sign me up, Jack. You're like, you're kidding me, right? No, I'm not. Let's look at the scriptures. 
James 1.12, God blesses those, or that word, remember that makairos that I talked about earlier, that Greek word for happy? God, happy those who patiently endure testing and temptation. Afterward, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Skip down to verse 25, James 1.25. But if you look carefully into the perfect law that sets you free, if you do what it says and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. God will make you happy for obeying. 1 Peter 3, verse 14. But even if you suffer for doing what's right, God will reward you for it. So don't worry or be afraid of their threats. 1 Peter 4, 14. If you're insulted because you bear the name of Christ, you will be blessed for the glorious Spirit of God rests upon you. How are we doing here? Persecution produces happiness. Serving others produces happiness inside of us. <laughs> Following the lust of our flesh does not produce happiness. It produces bondage. See, happiness is being content with where you are and what God has placed you and being at peace with yourself. When you're following the law of love and you're treating others as you want to be treated, you have no regrets. All your regrets are when you got out of love. Think about it. When you're not operating in love and treating others as you want to be treated, that's when you do and say things that you regret. That does not produce happiness. That produces shame. <laughs> That produces pain. I went to China some years ago. We brought Bibles in. It was kind of fun and exciting. But you know, when we interacted with the church there, the Christians, they had a deep happiness and a deep joy beyond anything I've probably experienced in the North American church with people. It was all over them, the joy of the Lord, the happiness. They were internally at peace with themselves, knowing that there was great cost for just serving Christ for them, potentially great cost. But you know, that changed me and encouraged me in my faith when I saw the joy that they had and the happiness that they had in serving the Creator freely. I started with Psalm 16. Happiness comes with spending time with God. This is what transforms you to become like Christ when you spend time with Him. When you're like Him in nature and in action, you can expect that not everyone's going to be happy about that. When Jesus was here, were they happy with Him when He acted like Jesus was supposed to act? When he was himself and he was Jesus and he walked around doing good and healing all who were sick and oppressed of the other, uh, the, the, like I can speak, the devil, how many know people were unhappy with him for that? They got upset because he healed people on the Sabbath day. They got upset <laughs> because he preached the truth and confronted them on their own hypocr hypocrisy. See, if they didn't like Jesus when, is he, when he was here, if you start looking like him, they may not like you so much either. I've talked to men and women in this building. And there was one guy I sat down with over coffee one time, and he said, you know, my family told me they liked me better when I was a, a violent drunk than I am now as a Christian who's trying to serve Jesus. I think about that, and I say, Wow. But I guess light always exposes the darkness within us. So if you start reflecting light and the glory of God is being reflected through your life, anyone that's in darkness and not willing to come into light is not going to like you reflecting light. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. Yes, and everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. You cannot be happy until you're like him. It's not the external things that make you happy. It's what goes on inside of you. If you're spending time with Christ, if you're becoming like him, if you're taking on his nature and character, if you're thinking his thoughts, if you're putting his word into your mind so that it's replacing the lies of the culture with the truth from the word of God, you will be drifting towards happiness, wholeness, mind, body, and spirit. Stand up with me, please, as we prepare to partake.
So we have first the bread, which represents the broken body of Christ. Father, I thank you that in your brokenness, you made a way for us to come to wholeness. And Lord, as we spend time in your presence, you transform us from the inside out into your image and into your likeness. You heal us of the pain of our past, the woundedness, and our bodies are restored to health and to wholeness. We have the mind of Christ, and our minds can be at peace because of what Christ has done for us. Today, Father, by faith, we activate the covenant that we have with you, and we thank you that you're changing us from the inside out. In Jesus' name. And the cup in our hand, which represents the blood of the new covenant. Blood of Jesus is a powerful force because nothing else has the ability to really forgive your sin except the blood of Jesus that was sacrificed for your sin and mine. Father, at the table, we all stand equal before you. Young and old, rich and poor, sinner and saint, man and woman, people from all the nations of the globe, we stand together. I thank you for the covenant that you have with us, that you died so that we could be free from the curse, that we could be free in our minds, that we could be free from sin. Today, Lord, help us to set aside the selfishness in our hearts as we purpose to take on your nature and as we focus, as your word says, on truth, on admirable things, on praiseworthy things, I thank you, Lord, that we can be content with where you've placed us. And as we spend time in your presence, let our desires become one with your desires. Align us to the plan you have for our life and we will be obedient subjects or servants in your kingdom to obey what you've asked us to do and go where you've asked us to go. In Jesus' name.